intersectionality and social work policy. Policies play an important role in managing the flow of immigrants into the United States. Policies are implemented at various levels, local, state, and federal. It's crucial to understand branches of the government, legislative, executive, and judicial. Each of these branches play an important role in shaping the immigration social policies and its impact on both the immigrants and the current citizens that are in our society. Current immigration policies have resulted in unfortunate consequences, such as family separation, detention center establishment, and deportation of long-term residents. The policies have created a fearful and discriminatory environment that perpetuates stereotypes and xenophobia in society. Moreover, these policies undermine the fundamental principles of equality and justice that America claims to uphold. The immigration system perpetuates a system of privilege and oppression by prioritizing specific individuals based on their race or nationality. It is crucial to reform these policies to establish a more inclusive and equitable immigration system that recognizes the importance of diversity and ensures equal opportunities for all individuals who aspire to build a better future in America. Only when we embrace these ideals and fulfill the promises of our nations can we truly live up to them. DACA recipients per state. I highlighted the top five, and I also highlighted Kentucky because I live in the state of Kentucky. But as you can see, California has the most DACA recipients in that state. Coming in at second is Texas. And then there's also Illinois, New York, and Florida. And Florida and New York are around about the same amount. Um, but if you're not from these states or you're not from Kentucky, find your state and see if there are DACA recipients in your state. Here are some DACA statistics for 2023 of this year. And as you can see, most of our DACA recipients are single but there's a good chunk that are actually married. I couldn't imagine being a DACA recipient that's married to somebody that very well may be a U.S. citizen, and they are now being told that um, you could be deported, You your DACA protection may not be forever, um, but most of these DACA recipients have been in the U.S since they were six years old or even younger. All they know is the U.S. to be their home. And then at the bottom, most of DACA recipients are females, but there are quite a majority of males as well. But our average age for DACA recipients looks to be about the age of 29. But there are some as young as 16 and under. Um, it doesn't give us an exact number of how young they are, um, but most of our DACA recipients are between the ages of 26 and 30. So they are right in their prime of their age, you know, they've already graduated, they're probably in college, or even have jobs that are contributing to our economy success, and now they have the potential of being deported at any time. Like, DACA recipients as of right now are safe, but it really just depends on who is in legislation and what they decide to do with DACA or if they will continue to protect the DACA recipients that we currently have and ones that maybe in the future want to apply as well.
someone who is entering the U.S. unlawfully. So this law was passed by a majority of white Republican officials who played the key role in supporting for the policy. Then we have things where how as President Obama, our first black president, took the executive action to allow children and young adults who were brought to the country illegally to apply for work permits and deportation relief so they can stay in the country. Many of the immigration laws that have been passed over time were signed off by white Republican males, with the Democratic Party having the least say in how to address the growing number of immigrants coming to America for a better life. Policy Guidelines To request for a DACA may be granted only if the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services meets the following criteria. We're under the age of 31 as of June 15, 2012. That means you would have to be born on or after June 16, 1981. Came to the United States before reaching your 16th birthday have continuously resided in the United States since June 15, 2007, or up to the time of filing the request for DACA, were physically present in the United States on June 15, 2012, and at the time of filing your request for DACA with the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, had no lawful immigration status on June 15, 2012, and at the time of the filing of the request for DACA, meaning you never had a lawful immigration status on or before June 15, 2012, or any unlawful immigrant immigration status or parole that you've obtained had expired on June 15, 2012, and any lawful status that you had after June 15, 2012 expired or otherwise terminated before you submitted your request for DACA or are currently enrolled in a school, have graduated, or obtained a certificate of completion from high school, have obtained a general education development, also known as GED certificate, or are honorably discharged veteran of the United States Coast Guard or Armed Forces of the United States, and you must have never been convicted of a felony, significant misdemeanor, or three or more misdemeanors and do not otherwise pose a threat to a national security or public safety. For any more information on policy guidelines for DACA recipients, there is a link at the bottom that you are more than welcome to click on to find out more information.
Given the historical and present-day context of race in the United States, the majority of discussion on racism and population health has appropriately centered on Black and Indigenous communities, while sometimes considering people of color more broadly. However, data also reveals health inequities for Latinos and Asian immigrants. As mentioned by Kamasaki, when you look at immigration policy through the lens of systematic racism, you can see that today's mostly Latino undocumented immigrants face much harsher punishment for the same crime of entering the country legally than white Europeans did in the past. A system that treats immigrants differently because of their race is a classic example of structural racism. This systematic racism is evident in the disproportionate rates of detention and deportation among Latino immigrants compared to their white European counterparts. Also, the lack of pathways to legal status for undocumented immigrants from certain countries further perpetuates these disparities and reinforces unequal treatment based on race. Please take a few minutes to watch this video published by the New York Times. What dreamers gain from DACA and stand to lose?
Deferred action for children arrival. It's a policy that delays the deportation of people who came to the U.S. as children. The program was created in 2012 through an executive action from for former President Barack Obama. This policy is a temporary protection for young immigrants. It prevents them from being deported and allows them to obtain work permits and obtain health insurance from employers who do offer it. This is a two-year protection and must be renewed before it expires. However, in the last few years, this policy has been at risk and many people who currently benefit from this policy are at risk for deportation. The ability to work legally has also enabled recipients to pursue higher education and even qualify for in-state tuition and state-funded education grants and obtain driver's license in many states. Most of the recipients come from Mexico and other Central or South American countries, as well as the Caribbeans. However, the fastest growing group of undocumented students are from, are from Asia. There are now greater protections for unaccompanied children. For example, in some cases, children travel crossing the border alone, without family. The, they may be traveling to joint parents already in the United States, or their parents may be sending them ahead to try to obtain greater opportunity for them. As a result of human rights activism, Unaccompanied and separated immigrant children are now placed in a child welfare framework by licensed facilities under the care of the Office of Refugee Replacement. They provide education, health care, and psychological support until they can be released to families or a community. Each year, 8,000 unaccompanied immigrant children receive care from the ORR. a breakdown of some of the positive and negative effects that DACA has served. Economically, a positive is increased revenue due to higher employment rates, better access to education, leading to higher paying job opportunities. A negative is there are limited job opportunities due to a lack of legal status in the United States. Socially, a positive is social integration, sense of belonging, a stronger family unit. A negative is increased fear and anxiety of potential policy changes, strains relationships with non-DACA eligible family members. Education is a positive access to higher education through in-state tuition, improved educational outcomes. A negative is limited financial aid programs. Many of them are encouraged to file for FAFSA but they do not qualify for federal financial aid, but they are encouraged to file for FAFSA because they can still get tuition assistance through their local and their state colleges, but they do not get any kind of federal aid. And there's unequal opportunities for DACA members compared to U.S. born citizens. Another alternative would be to extend an asylum agreement. So anyone who enters the U.S. seeking asylum should be allowed citizenship based off screening and criminal history and have a set list of reasons asylum can be granted or denied. But if they have parents or family that are already U.S. citizens, asylum should automatically be granted. For an example, the immigration detention centers could allow release with stipulations such as a release on bail or supervised release. That way, families are allowed to work and find homes until their citizenship has been approved without having to live in such poor conditions at those detention centers, especially the young children. As I researched alternatives for DACA recipients, I've come across a couple of different ideas. For undocumented immigrants or refugee immigrants that desire to be legal citizens of the United States, the first idea was to expand the humanitarian assistance program. 
But the more I looked into this idea, it didn't seem to be a good fit for what's currently going on with our, our DACA recipients. The humanitarian program assists refugee immigrants until their homeland is safe. The DACA recipients have only known the United States to be their home. One of the senators in 2004, his name was Orrin G. Hatch, pointed out in his speech, most came to America as children, plain, had no part in the decision to enter the United States, and may not even know that they are here illegally. But with that being said, many have graduated high school, they're working jobs, maybe even gone to college. He also made a good point. We should be looking at these people that are undocumented as people that are valuable to the resource of our nation. The more I looked at the issue at hand, what good would it be to legalize the DACA recipients but not their family members? Family is important. Breaking up homes and families is not the American way. I believe that Congress should be looking at a policy not only to help DACA or some known as the Dreamers, but also to help their families stay together. They could call this act Immigration Family Act. This would give the recipients and their undocumented family members who have been contributing to America for many years the chance to become legal as well and take the fear of deportation away from them. People that cross the borders illegally are coming here to work, according to Jeremy Robbins, the executive director of the New American Economy. This was said in 2001. Um, he gave us some data to consider. 88% of undocumented immigrants are of working age, which means 60% are native-born. Through that work, they are paying taxes. They are consuming goods where they're paying taxes. And so these undocumented immigrants pay more than $30 billion a year in taxes, and they have over $200 billion that they inject back into the economy through consuming. These are enormous, an enormous numbers. More than 800,000 of them have started businesses. Those businesses could be landscaping, a lot of different restaurants, but they are still paying taxes back into the economy. About 11 million people in our country of 330 million, so that would mean that Three out of every hundred people are undocumented. Just like any act, there will be rules, stipulations, and fees. The big question to me is why would our country want to jeopardize that revenue that is coming into our economy? Why would we want to split, family, split families up? There has to be a better way that is to legalize people that have been here for many years and contributed to the success of America today. What do you think? Recommendations. When undocumented parents are deported, they usually leave behind their children who are U.S. citizens. Separation can cause anxiety, stress, and even grief. A recommendation would be to propose a policy that could provide greater protection for vulnerable children in undocumented or mixed status families. In cases where a parent is deported, the child welfare should should be careful, um, carefully considering in whether to leave the child in care of a local caregiver or provide the option to send the child to the home country with their parent. This can prevent potential abuse that a child might go through while in the hands of the Department of Child Services. Sometimes people don't speak up or don't think they can make a difference, but there is a way. To promote intersectionality among immigrants, individuals can support comprehensive immigration reform that specifically tackles the distinct obstacles encountered by various immigrant communities. This involves advocating for policies that give priority to family reunification, establish pathways to citizenship, and safeguard the rights of undocumented immigrants. In addition, individuals have the opportunity 
to show their support for organizations that strive for social and economic justice for all immigrants. They can also take action by challenging discriminatory practices and stereotypes through educational initiatives and awareness campaigns. Sometimes people don't speak up or To promote the well-being of immigrants with diverse identities, the government should implement policies and programs that ensure equal access to education, health care, and housing. It is also crucial for the government to allocate resources toward providing cultural competency and sensitivity training for law enforcement and immigration officers so that all immigrants with diver diverse identities receive fair and just treatment. Furthermore, initiatives should be taken to promote economic integration within immigrant communities. This can be achieved by offering job opportunities and entrepreneurship programs for individuals with diverse backgrounds. A collective effort between the government, community organizations, and advocates is essential in understanding the unique challenges immigrants face with intersecting identities. This partnership will help develop comprehensive policies that can effectively address their specific needs. By following these steps, the government can create a more inclusive society that values and respects the rights and contribution of all immigrants.